frequently observed. Burning in progress. Got it. Um, I frequently observed the goings on of uh, the Timing uh, Research Forum, uh, and this is the first time I've participated uh, in a talk, and I'm delighted. Um, in uh, uh, you know, I think this is a this is a really wonderful community, um, uh, and I'm delighted to be invited to uh, share with you some uh, interesting stuff that hopefully will be uh, right up your alley. So, um, I've gotten in my old age uh, in the habit of blazing through uh, acknowledgments at the end, uh, and this makes me feel like a terrible person, so I've started putting it at the beginning. Um, today, uh, I will focus uh, on work from uh, my current students, uh, Ray Tao and uh, Ian Bright. Um, uh, you will see things from uh, past lab members, Yue Liu, who I think I saw on the, uh, on the, on the um, Zoom thing, Andre Lizardo. Uh, Jay Bladen and uh, much of the work, uh, much of the theoretical foundation this whole thing's built on is from collaborative work with Kardec Schenker, um, uh, starting back when we were at Syracuse. Um, I'll show you work, I believe, from uh, collaborators uh, Beth Buffalo at University of Washington, uh, Brandon Jacks at uh, UVA and Per Sudeberg at UVA, uh, and also uh, my former postdoc, uh, who's now a faculty member at Indiana, uh, Zoran Tiganj. So, hooray. All right. So I've been interested in time for a very, very long time uh, since I was a child that, you know, I was really fascinated by it. Um, and it's it seems really basic to our experience. Um, and uh, as a scientist uh, interested in uh, physics, uh, of course, time is a, a natural thing uh, to be uh, interested in. But also, I think it's fundamental uh, to um, how we understand the world. Uh, and uh, to problems in psychology and neuroscience, and I, perhaps I'm uh, speaking to the choir here. Um, so today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, basically uh, three uh, clumps of work. Um, I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to summarize. Uh, um, you know, decade plus of theoretical and uh, empirical work um, that or that sort of um, uh, works around the idea. Uh, of asking how is it that we remember the recent past, right? Um, and I think we're converging on an answer and there's like a, 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 a correct uh, answer certainly for how the brain uh, does its business. Uh, and I'm very excited about this and it's still an emerging uh, result, but I, I think it's becoming increasingly sound with uh, each passing uh, day. Um, then I'm gonna tell you about some work uh, that, um, uh, that we did uh, taking this these equations and this theoretical framework and this idea about how the brain represents time seriously, um, how would artificial networks behave differently if they incorporated those ideas uh, about how to represent the, the past? Uh, and I'll tell you some recent work uh, from deep neural networks. Uh, this is largely done in collaboration with uh, the group at UVA and in Indiana. Um, and I, I think this is pretty interesting. It turns out deep networks in, in, imbued uh, with a sense of time uh, that we think the brain has uh, outperform uh, drastically uh, uh, traditional networks like RNNs and LSTMs and uh, have these sort of uh, human-like properties that seem really interesting. And finally, and this is, I might skip this if I'm running out low on time, um, anticipating uh, questions that might uh, the people might have about relationships between the, the theoretical framework and uh, the empirical work I showed uh, and other widely uh, held uh, uh, widely pursued uh, ideas about how time works in the brain. I was going to talk specifically about how all this connects to uh, RNNs uh, and integrator models of timing. Um, if I, I might, if I'm running low on time, I might skip that and leave it to the questions. As uh, maybe you don't care, I don't know. Uh, so we'll see. All right. So um, here's the basic idea uh, about how uh, time works in the brain. Let's take a moment uh, and let's sort of notice. Uh, what happens um, after I clap. If we have a, a, a pause after the clap, it hasn't disappeared. It's still, uh, in some sense, uh, reverberating in our memory. And it seems, I don't know, to me at least, uh, it seems to me uh, that it sort of recedes into the past a little bit. And uh, le leaving aside me and leaving aside my introspection, this is a conclusion that has been reached by many, many philosophers over uh, in many traditions uh, over uh, many uh, years. Um, the idea that we have this sort of almost spatial record of the past that follows us along, kind of like a comet's tail, kind of like uh, a musical score. Um, so as notes unfold in, in real life, 
uh, across the top, there's some true uh, set of stimuli uh, f, uh, uh, f sub t as a function of tau in the past. Um, the, the idea is that what we're doing is at each moment as time unfolds, maintaining a record of that recent past, okay? Um, uh, sort of going downwards and to the left. And I'm, I'm borrowing this sort of uh, metaphor from Husserl. So the, the things that we have to add uh, to that are basically, and I've, I've tried to suggest this from how I've drawn the picture, that the past uh, records what happened when, uh, the what is analogous to different lines of the staff, the when is how far along uh, from the present you've gone. Uh, in addition, um, I've, drawn the, I've drawn the past to be foreshortened, such that notes that are further in the past appear smooshed together uh, relative to ones in the relatively recent past, and I've also blurred them out. Uh, and the idea being that there's this sort of gradual um, uh, compression of the past that unfolds. So that's sort of the spirit uh, of what I'm uh, going uh, to show you. I'm going to go through three things. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that same story uh, in three ways, right? I'm going to tell you, first of all, about uh, equations uh, that uh, we wrote down very early on uh, at Syracuse, like in 2010, um, to describe how this might happen. Um, and then I'll talk about neural evidence. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, really briefly, actually, flexible models of behavior uh, that, uh, that you can write down. And the, the basic aha we had was that if there was this timeline with this, these particular properties, I'm gonna explain that I sort of alluded to here and I'll explain in a little more detail, you could make sense of a ton of behavioral data. Um, and actually the behavioral data precedes the neural evidence. Um, uh, historically, I'm putting it in this order for expository purposes. All right, All right so equations, everybody. Got I guess it's morning on the East Coast of the United States, um, uh, but perhaps there's people joining us from all around. Uh, so hang on for a minute. If you really hate equations, I'll, I'll, um, I have a little bell here. I'll ring it when we're done with the equations and you can return to the uh, talk, but here we go. So the basic idea, thinking again about this uh, framework is that there's a true past, uh, F sub T of tau that records the past as a function of time tau. We want to make an estimate of that past, uh, which we'll call F tilde sub T of tau star, and we'll call this internal time. So the basic idea of this strategy is we want to go from uh, the objective past to uh, this sort of imagined, uh, this remembered past that has these properties that we want. Uh, the way we're going to do this uh, is we're going to first construct uh, an intermediate representation, uh, big F of S, Okay, which I'll show you equations for in a moment, um, which ends up being Laplace transform, real Laplace transform of the objective past. Uh, we'll then attempt to invert the Laplace transform uh, using this feed forward operator. Um, and this seems like a lot, but it's actually not uh, so terrible. I'll try and uh, I'll try and capture the intuition as we go through it. So um, first, uh, this these are the equations describing. Um, this intermediate representation, big F, right? Um, as input comes in at each moment in time, uh, F of T, every unit uh, in this population uh, obeys uh, this really simple differential equation. Uh, something interesting happens and they're perturbed uh, and then they decay uh, with a rate constant S. Um, critically, um, and S is a real number, uh, critically, across neurons, there's many, many different values of S. S is a continuous variable across this population of neurons. There's a spectrum of decay rates, there's a spectrum of rate constants, and we can treat them as effectively continuous, okay? Um, I'll show you later that there are cells in the noggin that appear to obey this, something like this differential equation with many different values of S. Um, okay, so if we solve that equation, uh, we see that uh, F of T, uh, so F sub T, the, the state of this population with a variety of uh, continuous S values at any moment uh, T is just the real Laplace transform of the recent past. Uh, if you don't know what a Laplace transform is, that's okay. Um, the trick is that we know that if we can write this equation of this form right here, we know that all the information in uh, the real past is stored in F of S. It's written across that continuous variable. Briefly, the continuous variable of time has been changed into this continuous variable of the rate constant of these neurons. 
And neurally, um, this, is, this just states that um, these cells should have exponential receptive fields uh, over the recent past with different values of S. Okay. Uh, one additional assumption uh, that we uh, is essential to describe behavioral data and also seems to be carried by the neural data is that we want the um, uh, we don't want the s values to be evenly spaced. And I'll return to this again in a minute. Um, I'll, I'll return to this a couple of times actually. So don't worry if you don't get this right this moment. Um, the values of s, the time constants, are not evenly distributed across uh, the timeline. They're distributed in such a way to build in this sort of foreshortening. Uh, that we see uh, in this hypothesized representation. All right, so that's uh, that's f of s. Um, so uh, and so we know uh, f of s Laplace real Laplace transform uh, of the recent past. Um, we make a mapping between another population of cells. And I, again, I'm going to go through this like 12 more times in a bunch of different ways, um, which are now indexed rather than by s rather than by the rate constant uh, of the neuron, they're indexed by some uh, number tau star. And these are going to end, these cells will end up supporting the timeline of the past. They will have receptive fields as a function of time uh, in just the same way, it, it, sorry, well, almost exactly the same way that cells, uh, photoreceptors along the retina have receptive fields as a function of retinal position, and that they respond to stimuli in a particular region of visual space. These cells respond to the presence of stimuli at a particular moment in the recent past, okay? Um, and so uh, this is the expression uh, for the post inversion. Um, it's a, a little bit of a bear. Um, the only thing you need to worry about really is it's taking derivatives with respect to S, just center sound surround receptive fields. And when you solve this equation, uh, coupled with this definition of f of s, uh, you find that uh, f tilde has these, um, these receptive fields centered in time, uh, but moreover, they depend uh, for each cell's tau star, they depend only on the ratio uh, tau over tau star. So they're scale invariant, and you end up with this log compressed um, representation of time. And if we take the expression for the rate constants here, the definition of tau star uh, as a function uh, being one over s over here, uh, we find that um, uh, we can do a little bit of juggling and we see that the nth uh, time cell um, is, uh, if, uh, its tau star uh, goes like um, log, uh, log tau star, right? Uh, so there's this uh, logarithmic compression. And I'm gonna come back to this in a bunch of different ways. So that was, oh, wait, hang on a second. There's the end of the Harry equations. Um, so I'll show the same thing in pictures. Um, and so we're hypothesizing that there's some objective past um, clap and the clap is receding into the past. As time goes by, that clap is further and further from the present. It's like a delta function over the true objective continuous time. We have a continuous value uh, of S written into this uh, population of neurons, big F. And we have a continuous variable for tau star with receptive fields along that time axis. Uh, here I'm drawing pictures of what these equations look like following a delta function. Uh, and the neurons in F of S, they all respond immediately and then they decay at a variety of rates. The, the heterogeneity of rates is essential uh, for this to work. Um, and then the cells in F tilde, they, fought, they fire sequentially. Uh, with with receptive fields in as the as the as the blip and as the clap enters their receptive field in time they fire okay and so you see a sequence of cells fire as it enters and leaves different receptive fields and because of this log compression the receptive fields get broader in time and less numerous right um and so I'm, in the on the right part of this uh, figure i'm showing these equations uh as a color scale um, so that we can, so this is how, is how like neuroscientists show uh, populations of neurons, um, so that we can compare them to data later on. Um, and so the, the, popu the top is F, big F, the bottom is F tilde, and F tilde with this log compression makes this very characteristic hook uh, cells that fire sequentially. Each, in these plots, each row is a cell uh, and the x-axis is time. And so you're sort of taking this entire population and tiling out the receptive fields. Um, and so I should, I should talk about from a computational neuroscience perspective, um, all of these ideas uh, to one extent or another uh, predated us, right? 
Uh, Tony Lindeberg in particular had, uh, you know, this belief, this uh, uh, in his uh, temporal scale space theory uh, proposed this um, logarithmically, uh, this geometric series of uh, exponential, uh, exponentially decaying cells. Tank and Hopfield used, ex turned out to use exactly the same expression that you get from solving these equations. Uh, in a paper a while ago, Grossberg uh, did a ton of stuff with sequences and I'm leaving out a bunch of people. Uh, and of course, in psychology, we were very much inspired um, uh, by uh, people like uh, John Gibbon and uh, uh, Randy Gallistol and uh, Peter Balsam. Uh, Balsam and Gallistol is actually one of the papers we had up on the board uh, and on the day we uh, wrote all that stuff down. So um, so the, the outcome of all this, uh, putting it all together, is that the hypothesis is that um, Time cells, we'll, we'll see that they exist in a minute. Uh, time cells have receptive fields that evenly tile the log time axis, okay? And if we plot them as a function of regular time, we'll see that they spread out and they're less numerous. But if we plotted them as a function of log time, uh, we'd see, uh, we'd see them, that they're evenly spaced. Okay. All right, so that ends the formal model. Uh, so now we'll talk about some neuroscience. So it turns out that pretty much everything I just told you happens to one degree or another in the noggin. Um, there was a phenomenon observed um, uh, originally by Eva Pashtelkova uh, and then later by uh, Chris McDonald in uh, Howard Eichenbaum's lab uh, called time cells that, uh, in which these populations of cells fire sequentially. I'm showing you the, um, uh, an early and representative example uh, of these cells in A. Uh, in hippocampus. Uh, and so as something interesting happens here, the delay of a memory experiment uh, starts, but it turns out not to matter so much uh, what exactly uh, starts the interval. As long as there's something there, some cells are gonna fire in sequence. Um, uh, the cell on the top fires early in the delay, the cell in the middle fires a little later and the one later on fires uh, yet later. And, and I've chosen them, uh, I've chosen them a little bit cheesily by picking ones where the um, and the fields get wider, uh, but that turns out to be really representative. Um, in B, uh, it's a picture uh, also from Boston University. This is uh, from Will Mao, um, showing a sequence of 172 simultaneously recorded time cells uh, in the delay of a memory experiment in the hippocampus is CA1. Uh, you'll notice the curvature uh, as hypothesized by this log time. Uh, hypothesis, the dashed uh, red line in case, uh, just for funsies, is exactly the curve you'd get if there was log compression. Um, and C, um, I'm just picking another brain region kind of at random. This is uh, medial prefrontal cortex, actually. This is um, Bulkin et al. from uh, Josh Gordon's lab. Um, so we know now uh, that you see these sequentially activated time cells in half a dozen brain regions, for sure hippocampus, for sure medial prefrontal cortex, for sure lateral prefrontal cortex. Um, uh, ben Krauss saw stuff that looked kind of like this in MEC. Uh, and there's a great, there's a large body of work from uh, uh, especially Joe Patton and Alana Witten uh, showing sequences uh, like this in striatum and DLPFC and they're all over the brain, okay? Um, and when you go look for it, you see this curvature seems to be pretty systematic. So the, the timeline, such as it is, is logarithmically compressed. Uh, in addition, I haven't really shown you here. Um, in addition, you can, in many circumstances, in many brain regions, um, decode what happened when, right? So if you have two distinct stimuli that begin a delay, you can, in many cases, decode uh, what stimulus happened when in the past, right? So as if there's different lines of the staff uh, that we were showing. And I'm summarizing dozens of papers here, so you kind of have to take my word for it, but. I'm being, uh, I'm being truthful and forthcoming. Okay, whoops. All right, and so for a very long time, and so that's sort of one of the predictions. Um, the other prediction of, uh, oh, this is, uh, this is uh, these are uh, two results from monkeys. Oh, by the way, we see time cells in um, mice, uh, uh, rats, monkeys, and I just saw a submission of a really nice human time cell paper. Um, uh, that a friend of mine shared with me. I'm not, re I'm not, I'm not reviewing it. I'm not breaking confidence or anything. Um, but I, I, there, there will be a really good human time cell paper pretty soon, I think. Um, so, uh, so for a very long time, we've, so we've seen time cells now everywhere, right? Like all over the noggin. Um, and for a while we were getting worried because uh, the model makes two predictions. There should be this population of sequentially activated time cells, check, 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 check. Um, but there should also be this other population of cells that are, uh, are 
activated when something interesting happens and then decay at different rates. Um, and so uh, Albert Sow, uh, working in the Moser lab, uh, published a uh, paper in Nature in 2018 uh, showing kind of uh, this uh, in uh, rodent LEC. Um, and we followed up uh, with a paper uh, in collaboration with Beth Buffalo, um, my student Ian Bright and uh, her student uh, Miriam Meister uh, worked out, uh, did these analyses in a population of neurons recorded from uh, the entorhinal cortex, and that's in the upper right. And we saw that these cells, un, rather than fire sequentially, uh, they, they carried information about time, but rather than firing sequentially, they activated within 100, 200 milliseconds of the onset of a visual stimulus, and then they decayed at different rates. So uh, we've, we found evidence for all of the pieces, uh, uh, sorry, almost all of the pieces of this hypothesis. The other piece, which I haven't shown you yet, but I'm about to show you this moment, uh, is that the time constants are actually distributed um, like log time, right? That the, the sequences fire as a function of log time. Um, and there's a paper up on BioArchive, which we're revising, uh, well, which Ray and Jay are, are revising for, um, uh, for eLife, uh, that uh, very carefully and rigorously uh, studies the hypothesis that the time cells are distributed as a function of log time. And I can go into the details of all this, but actually I think probably the easiest way for me to convince you of this result is to just show what the time fields look like uh, as it plotted as a function of log time. And so remember there's that curvature over and over and over again as a function of time time. If I, if I knew the shape of that curvature and I undid it, I should get a straight line. And so apparently choosing, uh, choosing uh, log axis uh, is enough to undo it to the extent you accept that that looks kind of like a straight line of, of uh, similar width. And I guess you could reach different uh, conclusions about that, um, but also we did all these other analyses. Uh, and I wanna point out also, uh, there's a paper um, by uh, Guo uh, and some other people in Rieger uh, which is actually in, um, sorry, it's, it's no longer in BioArchive, it's in Nature Communications 2021 um, that shows even better evidence for log compressed time constants uh, here in the cerebellum, in a cerebellum, cere cerebellar slice, okay? Uh, which is, I think, pretty astounding. So this is quite satisfying. Um, it suggests that this representation of time uh, in the noggin uh, is very much uh, like uh, retinotopic coordinates uh, in vision. Right. We know that the receptive fields in the visual system are also uh, a, a function of log, uh, log distance uh, from the fovea. Uh, we know the Weber-Fechner law holds for many, 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 many things. Um, and we know from uh, work by Luz Spalke and uh, Stanislas Lahaney and, uh, and again, Randy Gallistol and um, Liz Brannon and uh, other, other people I'm probably leaving out, uh, that the nonverbal number system, uh, Rachel Gelman, uh, also shows this uh, sort of uh, kind of logarithmic compression. Uh, Dieter and Miller. Okay. So uh, this seems like uh, this seems like a very general principle for how the noggin is doing its business. All right. So I'm gonna. So this is the behavioral models bit, uh, and I'm gonna go really fast through here. Um, we 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 made the hypothesis. We wrote the equations out because we knew that if you had a representation like that. Right, you could account for a number of behavioral results. My my, my uh, you know graduate work was in modeling you know how people learn lists of words, uh, and you know took that very seriously. Um, and I'm not going to be able to go into the sort of details of these. Um, I'm going to point you at these two papers: uh, Segerview paper from 2015 and um, a more recent paper from Zoran Tiganj in um, in CogSci. Um, basically, if we assume that we have a representation. Uh, like that, this logarithmically compressed timeline. This is like what happened when. This is supposed to be after you learned to list uh, G, K, L, N, T, X, H, right? This is a, a, a picture of what the what when representation would look like uh, at the end of the past. If you could direct attention to that, much the same we, way we direct attention to visual display, and you could build associative memory models, and you could, uh, you know, um, build reasonable, uh, you know, distributed neural networks, uh, like uh, from we've been doing in episodic memory research for a really long time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You could build out behavioral models of a ton of different work. And I'm just going to go blaze through these. Uh, this is long-term judgment of recency. Uh, this is medium-term judgment of recency. It's laboratory memory task, uh, data and model. Um, this is a conditioning task uh, from uh, Cole Barnett and Miller. Uh, in which animals have to form temporal maps uh, of their environment. 
Um, this is uh, some free recall, uh, free recall experiment that I actually did uh, at Syracuse a while back. Uh, um, and this is, uh, this is a short-term judgment of recency. Um, this gives us some sort of flavor of this. Uh, you're looking at response time as a function of uh, time in the past at which a probe was given. And the interesting thing, which possibly you can see, uh, is that uh, the response time goes up linearly with log of the time in the past the probe was presented. And anyway, you can build many, many cognitive models. I encourage you to uh, build your own. Um, uh, it's, it's easy and everything works. Okay. <laughs> uh, so to summarize, this comes to the end of the discussion I wanted to have about natural time. I wanna save some time for artificial time. So let me summarize. There is overwhelming evidence that there that populations of neurons in many brain regions uh, form temporal basis functions over time, right? Uh, these time cells, we see them in many brain regions, right? It's not just hippocampus, it's all over the place. There is good evidence, meaning very strong evidence for a small subset of these studies where it's been carefully investigated for logarithmic compression of that timeline. Um, in at least two brain regions. I'll take our hippocampus paper and that cerebellum paper, a uh, cerebellum paper, mm, chef kiss, it's gorgeous. Um, so there's, there's, you should take that seriously. Uh, there's good evidence for uh, this other set of basis functions with these exponential uh, receptive fields um, in entorhinal cortex uh, from our work and from Albert Sow's. Um, and I will say that um, after people started looking for time cells, they found them a lot. After people appreciated the sort of significance of that, uh, all of a sudden everyone noticed that they had them in their data. I would I would like it very much if if there was a similar phenomenon uh, with these uh, you know exponent spectrum of time constants of of integrators. Uh, and finally. Uh, you can build cognitive models of many different memory tasks that match behavior quite well. Um, so you can take these equations seriously, uh, both for describing the activity of populations of neurons and also for building cognitive models. All right. All right, I'm gonna take a moment. I'm gonna drink some water and then we'll do some uh, artificial neural network. Hmm. Okay. Oops. Okay. So um, why does the brain have log scales? Right. So I just showed you that um, I just showed you that uh, the noggin has um, uh, uh, logarithmically distributed time constants. And even if you don't believe that, there's no question that the brain has logarithmically distributed scales for uh, you know visual space, right? Um, to the extent to the extent the Weber Fechner law holds anywhere, right? Uh, the brain has a logarithmic scale for that thing, and it, I, I, I'm I'm all in on it seeming pretty general. Okay, uh, noggin, uh, you know, the brain mammalian brain has been subject to a bazillion years of evolution. It must have, uh, and there's no conceivable way in which the mechanisms that place the biophysical mechanisms that place receptors on the retina, and that form a spectrum of time constants in the cerebellum, there's no conceivable way that that just happens to be something that has to happen from, uh, from you know, way from biophysics. So there must be do doing something advantageous. There must be something really helpful, I would argue, uh, that's led the brain to uh, choose to do this over and over and over again. Okay, uh, and here's a suggestion um, about why this is helpful. Um, and we'll note in a moment that artificial networks endowed with this property also uh, do things that are good, <laughs> uh, sort of a lot. That's why we're talking about this now. So on the uh, left, I've shown you again the time cells from uh, the Ray and Jay paper um, from hippocampus, and there's this nice curvature as a function of time. And you see this straight line as a function of log time. What I'm showing you on the right is I'm showing you a function in blue Okay, and then I'm showing you exactly the same function with time rescaled, right? So I took T to AT, where A is like two or something like that, okay? And you see that these, uh, these, these functions look kind of, they're very different in their, uh, in some sense, but they're also not very different. One is squished, okay? So uh, one is stretched out, one is squished. If you put them as a function of log time, uh, and I just took exactly the graph, I took exactly the numbers and I just plotted them as a function of log time, you'll notice that the, they now look exactly the same except translated along, right? The, uh, the, 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 
the, the squiggles are identical, except they're in a different location, right? Um, a log scale, uh, and this basically follows because of the little bitty equation we remember from eighth grade at the top, uh, log AX uh, is equal to log X plus log A, right? Taking a variable and rescaling it is equivalent, is equivalent to translating it uh, as a function of, uh, is, is, a, is a function is equivalent to translating its log, right? Um, and this is uh, like on the one hand, eighth grade math. On the other hand, this is really profound, right? It means that if you have a brain endowed with uh, log time axis, it means you don't have to know the scale, the time scale. You don't have to know whether you're interested uh, in, uh, you know, you don't have to know the time scale a priori, right? So if I so if I built a set of receptors and I spaced them, say I had a time cell every one second, okay? And then there's something I have to remember over hundred milliseconds where I have to pay attention to hundred millisecond uh, deviations, I'm out of luck because I have no ability to discriminate that, those times because they're, they're falling into the same receptor. Conversely, if I've chosen uh, the receptive fields uh, to be spaced at one second, there's something really, really interesting over hundred seconds. I need lots and lots and lots of receptors to very redundantly uh, express this uh, slow signal. Um, so intuitively uh, choosing log time means uh, that I don't have to know a priori whether I care about one second or 100 milliseconds or uh, 10 seconds or 100 seconds, right? If I have a log axis that tiles all of those things, I'm going to get similar temporal resolution over each of those scales. And this will build um, a noggin uh, or a brain uh, that is good at lots of stuff. So the first thing we did, and here again, I should mention, uh, this is Brandon Jacks uh, and uh, UVA uh, and Zoran Tiganj made uh, essential uh, contributions. Um, so the first thing we did uh, to see if uh, this holds uh, is we built a um, network uh, called Deep Sith. Um, Sith is the um, UVA preferred branding uh, for this, uh, which I pass along without uh, comment. Uh, scale invariant temporal history. Um, the basic idea is that we have a uh, deep network, okay, and each layer is like a musical score of what cross when, okay, and each layer, the when dimension, uh, going into the screen here, is logarithmically compressed, okay, and so far that's almost it. Uh, the only difference is that there's learnable, modifiable weights between each layer uh, that make the definition of what change from uh, one layer to the next. Kind of like in, uh, you know, uh, auditory cortex, you might, uh, so as you, as, sorry, as you follow, uh, you know, uh, a sound uh, through, uh, you know, the auditory stream, you might have, uh, uh, you might have what uh, meaning different things, right? So you might have like phonemes and words and uh, sentences and thoughts as you go further uh, up the hierarchy. So what uh, means something different, uh, but every layer has what cross when. Okay, that's it. This is the whole network. Um, and so surprisingly, well, I, yeah, actually, I was very surprised by this. Um, this network destroys, like, not even close uh, RNNs and LSTMs, which are these really widely used uh, deep networks, uh, at these uh, sort of toy uh, memory problems. Uh, so I'll give you a couple of examples and try and give you a flavor of why this is. Um, okay, so this is, uh, um, let me get a nice one. All right, so this is, and so the basic strategy here is uh, you build a bunch of tasks, uh, you try to have the networks uh, uh, classify some stimuli. In this case, uh, we're just trying to get the networks to classify Morse code digits, okay? Uh, so dot, 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 dash, dash, or whatever, that's like, uh, uh, L uh, and okay, and so you have to uh, teach the networks to do this. And basically, every network in the world is really good at this. Okay, uh, LSTMs and RNNs and um, this other thing, and, and DeepSith is also very good at that. Okay, now to make the make the problem harder, we then took the Morse code digits and we put them at the end of a delay that increases um, uh, uh, delay filled with random dots and dashes. Okay. That's a variable length. Uh, and so the different lines here are different lengths of that delay. Uh, and you see that this deep Sith network has no problem and it learns really quickly uh, no matter what the delay is. And, and although the LSTM and the, this is a super fancy uh, RNN uh, do uh, pretty good 
uh, at the uh, shorter delays, as it gets longer and longer, they go to heck. Right? Uh, we couldn't even get regular um, RNNs to train on this task. Right? Uh, we had to use a super fancy uh, co-RNN. Uh, this is the adding problem, uh, which is um, actually kind of famous in the machine learning community. Uh, the adding problem was introduced uh, in the first LSTM paper as a as a, a problem that's supposed to be especially difficult uh, to learn uh, because you have to remember information. Um, uh, and so there's uh, basically there's two bits uh, and one of them uh, is a random deviate and the other one is on for exactly two time points. The problem is to report at the end of the sequence um, the sum of the one bit when the other uh, one was on, right? And it's kind of a silly problem. Uh, but this is this is this is the ship that launched the LSTM. Uh, this is the this is the uh, this was the problem that uh, LSTMs were designed to solve. Um, and so basically, what we did is we just took that problem and we just stretched the delay out. We made it wait longer and longer and longer and longer and longer. Uh, although all the networks do okay when you have to hold on to it for 100 time points, uh, as you make it 500 time points or 2,000 time points or 5,000 time points, the other networks fall. Uh, apart and never learn it. There's this big uh, uh, thing at the top, but uh, in contrast, the deep sift model couldn't care less. It learns quickly uh, no matter how long the delay is. There's, there's some upper limit, but it's exponentially large, right? Because it goes up, because you have a log time scale. Uh, that means as you commit resources, the biggest time scale goes up like e to the, e to the n. And so that's pretty good. But how do you have about 10 minutes? Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, perfect. Um, I'll leave the. I'll probably leave the questions for questions. Okay, so so far, uh, so good. Um, for those of you who might be really interested in deep networks, um, if you want to ask a question about that, I have a really nice slide uh, with um, uh, some results from UA, uh, arguing that um, this is equivalent to a deep reservoir computer, but with a very specific reservoir. And you don't know what that means. That's okay. Um, all right. So let's do a thought experiment. Uh, I'm going to do one more deep network and then we'll wrap up. And um, if you want to talk about RNNs or integrator models or whatever, I'm happy to. Um, all right, let's do a thought experiment. Uh, sorry, that, that's me thinking. That's not a thought experiment. Uh, so let's, let's try to categorize uh, digits. Um, actually, one of the things we're going to, we train networks on is like the, um, there's uh, auditory sequences where there's like a sound and then you have to say what digit it was, right? And it's pretty easy and you can train networks to do this. Um, and you too can do this. Um, so let's let's do a thought experiment. Let's let's try to decode a couple of digits that I say. Uh, two. Did you get that one? Oh yes. Uh, nine. Uh, so straightforward. Um, seven. Easy peasy. Okay, watch this. Try to decode this one. Seven. Get that one. Hopefully you did. <laughs> Hopefully you did, or the, the next part of this talk is going to be really uh, not great. Uh, most people can do this. Um, I've tested uh, tested everyone in my family. Um, most people can do this. Uh, but congratulations, uh, state of the art deep networks can't do that. Right? Uh, they do not generalize to rescaled. Um, uh, stimuli. So, sorry, if you train them on saying seven over three seconds, they can do that, right? But if you train them on regular spoken speech, and then you give them without ever teaching them about it, slowed speech or sped up speech for that matter, um, they don't generalize, right? Uh, and I'll show you some evidence for this in a minute. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we had a network that did that? And how might we do that? Whoops. Well, we might use this uh, strategy. So I was just telling you about, you know, log compression means that rescaled speech seven really slow is just translated in time. So here I'm showing you a picture of waveforms actually uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, actually this is actually the word seven, uh, spoken seven, uh, being spoken at different rates and these are just smooshed versions of one another. So uh, we built a deep network, uh, a new deep network, Okay, um, that is able to generalize across these uh, rescaling. So in blue uh, is this thing we're calling it a SIFCON network, 
uh, in uh, orange is uh, this traditional temporal convolution network. Uh, and so we train on uh, the MNIST digits at, a at, the, at the speed they're given. Uh, we're calling that uh, scale one, okay? And both networks do really, really well. Uh, but then without retraining, we're making things faster or slower. Uh, and we see that the SithCon network in blue, uh, it maintains its performance over a very wide range of scales, uh, whereas the other one falls apart uh, really abruptly, okay? Um, and how did we do that? Uh, basically, uh, we added something called a convolutional layer. And this is pretty standard in visual neuroscience. Um, the idea is that um, the idea is that um, uh, a CNN, uh, a convolutional neural network, um, gives out, it has a set of weights and it tells you where it found those weights. And then by integrating over those dimensions, um, it tells you uh, what is out there uh, and throws away the uh, envision the where. Right, so if you have a, a face or something like that, if you have a convolutional filter for a face, it will say there's a face there regardless of whether where the face is translated along your visual display. So too, uh, using the same trick, uh, we can uh, build a scale invariant, uh, a, a time uh, scale dilation invariant neural network uh, using these ideas. Oops, oops, I think I have another, okay. Um, and so that's, uh, that's the story. Um, I should add uh, two things. Uh, one is there's precisely one function that has this property. If, you, if, if this happens precisely because we chose the distribution of time constants to be even on a log scale, if there was any other mathematical expression at all, I, I get to choose the base of the logarithm, right? Uh, but that's it, right? Uh, if there was any other function at all, this wouldn't work. Uh, and you all uh, and every, uh, person ever uh, can uh, do this task spontaneously in uh, deep neural networks uh, without a log compressed uh, representation of time cannot. So this seems like a place where uh, time in the brain is helping deep networks. Um, I'm very interested, actually this, this slide is basically just a pointer. Uh, so I showed you a whole bunch of log distributed time scales and sequences and stuff in a whole bunch of places, but I didn't say anything about auditory cortex. And I think it might be just because I don't know the literature that well. Uh, I'm showing this picture of sequentially activated cells uh, in auditory cortex uh, as a function of time after presentation of a stimulus. Uh, this is from uh, Carolyn Runyon uh, when she was in Chris Harvey's lab. Um, and anyway, this is a pointer. If you know this literature better than me, uh, I'm very interested to know about it. Um, and uh, there's also this recent PNAA PNAS paper from Rahman et al. Um, so it might be the case that there's also this log distributed set of time constants uh, in entrinal, in auditory cortex, um, but I don't uh, know that for sure. Sorry, my dog just came back from his walk. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of uh, stop here and uh, take questions. Let me summarize the bit about this artificial neural networks. Uh, we can build deep neural networks uh, out of log compressed time cells. We have uh, stuff, it works really nice. Um, uh, I'll show you the link to the GitHub in a minute. Uh, these net networks generalize really well because they don't have an a priori time scale. You can throw them at different problems uh, and uh, because they don't have to, they don't have a problem with backpropagation through time, they can learn slow stuff really easy. Long range temporal dependencies are easy for these networks in a way that contemporary RNNs and LSTMs have serious problems with. Um, I find it as a psychologist pretty appealing that uh, memory, you know, the, the remembering the past, clap, there it goes, and all these behavioral uh, memory experiments uh, kind of ends up, uh, uh, the, the same equations that give us the properties we want for memory also give us the nice properties we want for time rescaling perception. I find that really sort of aesthetically satisfying. Um, so hooray. Um, I mean, these are some things, these are, I'll go quick over the slides I'm not going to show you um, and tell you two more things real quick. Uh, and then we'll close up. I, I mostly wanted to get to the, um, uh, the, the GitHub in case you want to play with Deep Sith. So to summarize, time is represented as a continuum in many brain regions, right? There's two forms of receptive fields in time, at least, right? Uh, we see these, uh, these uh, sort of compact receptive fields that look like time cells where they fire in sequence. We also see this spectrum of time constants uh, with exponential, uh, exponential receptive fields. Um, you can take these equations, you can make deep uh, neural networks, they work great. Um, 
and I haven't talked about it today, but you can take the same equations if you have access to this Laplace transform. You can take the same equations and generalize to other. You, you don't generalize. You generalize uh, to other continua, uh, including uh, position and evidence and image size. And um, we're thinking about this really, really broadly. All right, so there's lots of interesting problems in neuroscience, math, and AI uh, that you might be interested in working on. I'm happy to help people adopt this. Um, I think this is like, uh, I think this is really powerful and uh, really a gem. Uh, and I hope lots of people uh, make use of it. Uh, and here's a GitHub for uh, the Deep Sith Network in case you want to build your own little robots. All right, the end. Oh, and I did acknowledge it's ready, so I don't have to do this again. So, there I am. Done. All right, thank you so much. Um, it was really interesting. So if there are any questions, please go ahead and raise your Zoom hand, or you can also put it in the chat and I can ask it for you. Asaf, please go ahead. Hi, Mark. Thanks for the talk. Super, super interesting. Um, I have two questions, maybe unrelated. The first is, do we know whether the in terms of the physiological properties of the time cells, whether the delays are a result of some kind of delay that's inherent in the cell itself in terms of um, latency of refractory period or something, yeah. or is it possible that there is some other clock that these cells um, look at and this is how they receive through their connections with that clock, they receive their that, that, that results in this kind of different yeah, yeah. delays. And the second question is, in, in the real, in, in real life environments, we have a lot of intervals that start every, every you, can, you, don't, you don't know what you are counting towards, but you have to start your timer for many, many, many events that happen. So does this process happen in parallel for everything that can happen in the environment, and can you estimate the computational complexity or or the you know the load that you need in terms of compute, compute, computing units? Um, so to answer the second question, yeah, I think this goes on all the time. I don't think this is turned on because all of a sudden you put the rat in a memory experiment. I think we remember exactly. the recent past. I didn't. I didn't. You know. I, I think it would be impossible to follow a sentence uh, if you didn't have memory of the past. I think it would be impossible to uh, do almost anything if you didn't have some uh, memory uh, going on. I think that different parts of the brain are doing different computations with this experience, right? And, uh, you know, if you have like musical training, you're the what you extract from a sequence of sounds is very different than you know someone who's you know from a different musical tradition who doesn't have any musical training at all, right? And so too um, different. And so we definitely learn what we're paying attention to, and what we pay attention to might depend on our goals and uh, you know the different tasks and uh, different parts of the brain region. But yeah, it seems like time is built in everywhere, right? Um, so that's the second question. The first question I wrote. I tried to write something down to remember it. Let me see if I can reconstruct it. Um, the question is, how? What, what is the source ultimately of this heterogeneity of time scales across different brain regions? Okay. And so I think um, there's a number of, I don't think there's a need that it's the same answer. So in the cerebellum, at least, um, they, they were recording from the slice, right? And they had like, they, they noted that the spectrum of time constants they, see, they saw uh, was associated with a gradient in um, the efficacy of a, of a metabotropic glutamate receptor, right? Um, in, the, in the entorhinal cortex, uh, Michael Hasselmo and I have pursued in a couple of papers uh, with UA, in case he's still here, um, uh, the hypothesis that there's uh, intrinsic, uh, intrinsic channels, uh, there, there are intrinsic channels on uh, entorhinal uh, neurons that are specific to this uh, cation, uh, cation non-specific calcium activated channel, right? Um, you could also, anything that gives a dynamical system that is a, di that is a diagonal matrix, right? <laughs> Where there's different values of S uh, along the diagonal, um, you're going to get this result. I, I think it's likely that there's a heterogeneity of mechanisms uh, throughout the noggin. In the case of, if, if it is true, and we don't know this yet, but I mean, I'm all in on this, right? 
Uh, the Mosers, I'm told the Mosers are doing an experiment where they disrupt the exponentially decaying cells and then see what happens in the entrinal cortex and then see what happens to the ongoing time cells in the hippocampus, right? Which would be definitive, I, assuming they do the experiment right. Um, so if the equations are correct, time cells are just inheriting their time from whatever's running the uh, real Laplace transform. Whatever's making the spectrum of S is basic. There's just a linear transformation going from big F to F tilde, right? Um, and so that's that, that's the best I can answer that question. Thank you. You're welcome. I have no idea the order in which people raised their hands. Um, Hello, Sarah. Yeah, so that was very nice. I appreciate it. A lot of the insights you had, mostly that uh, low temporal frequencies are generally ignored by people and they're really key to understanding time. Yeah. But um, you, know, you, you, you didn't, you didn't uh, capture the fact that time is two dimensional and uh, that, that you know, means that your receptive fields, your temporal receptive fields were all positive. And in fact, there's inhibition and what inhibition does oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. is set timing. And so real receptive fields have inhibition, you know, so lag cells have early inhibition and transient cells have late inhibition. And that's what really creates timing and what really counts as phase. So you really have to go to the two dimensional view and think in terms of phase to understand timing, I think. Yeah, I think it's an excellent point. Um, oh, as an aside, I, I blurred over this, but the, the cells in the entorhinal cortex, um, if you read the paper, uh, actually both of the entorhinal cortex uh, papers are referred to, the cell one and then also Bright et al. and PNAS. Um, I didn't talk about this in the talk. Um, most of the cells are actually uh, when something interesting happens, they turn on and then they decay. A subset of the cells, maybe 20, 30%, um, they're actually inhibited by the stimulus. Something interesting happens and then they deactivate and then recover uh, with different time constants. So yeah, it, it, exactly right. Uh, I think that's true. I thought you were gonna, um, initially thought you were gonna talk about uh, complex time uh, and um, uh, this interesting uh, 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 result in uh, physics. Um, and then I thought maybe you were going to talk about future time, which is actually something we think about. As we go through the, as we go through our day, um, A, B, A, B, I not only remember A, after I present A, I not only remember A happened in the past, I can also predict that B is coming uh, closer uh, to us as time unfolds. Uh, we've given that a lot of thought as well, uh, but outside the scope of this nice uh, concise story. Right, Alessandro. Yeah, thank you very much for your for your talk. Very interesting. I have two questions. Uh, one of which might be a bit technical. Uh, okay, technical first. So you're using um, Laplace transform and the inverse Laplace transform to get uh, the shape of the activity. So isn't isn't the inverse Laplace transform very sensitive to noise? Yeah. No. Th this is. Um, yeah. The how of the inverse Laplace transform, we've been using post approximation. Um, and if you were paying close attention, you see there's a kth derivative with respect to S and a little bit of noise uh, going through the kth derivative gets blown up. And um, yeah, we've given that some thought. Um, first of all, I don't take the post inversion formula literally, right? Um, actually, we've been. Uh, in the deep networks, it's it's the post of the post inversion formula ends up being impractical in the deep networks. Um, we've been exploring. It turns out there's dozens and dozens of methods, some of which don't have such pro such problems. Uh, right now, we're very excited about complex exponential matrices as an inversion formula, uh, which <laughs> works really nicely. In reality, what I think is actually happening in the brain, right, is I think that there's a nonlinearity, right. Um, basically anything, if you've chosen the S values to be in a geometric series, basically any center surround, you know, dynamic network, like, um, like a, a cortical, a cortical uh, a peak enhancement uh, will maintain scale invariance as long as it's with respect to cell number, right? As long as it's with respect to cell number. And I, I think um, I'd really love it if, um, like real life computational neuroscientists, especially those doing vision, that like this seems to be worked out pretty well in vision um, if they replace this silly post approximation. Yeah, the, the post approximation, uh, the post approximation should be taken seriously, but not literally, right? 
Uh, it is certainly the case as real Laplace transform. It is also certainly the case that in the case of these really simple functions that behave like delta functions, right? Uh, you know, um, we see things that look as if they're approximating the inverse transform, right? Um, if the inputs are sufficiently sparse, you don't really need to invert the transform. You just need to get a bump in the right spot. So uh, that's, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love it. Love, 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 love it. If um, people who know what they're doing uh, took that up. There's, okay. there's much better things to do than post approximation. Okay, good, great, thanks. The second question um, is related to um, your numerical experiments with the other um, uh, uh, machine learning structures, right? Mm -hmm. and stuff. So I, I think in your network, you then put all these 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 rate constants in, right? So you have a diversity of rate constants, and but if you take a, a RNN uh, or an LSTM, could you just enhance those with a diversity of rate constants somewhere and get something? Yeah, you might. Yeah, we've thought about this, and there's people who've worked on initializing, uh, like initializing the forget gates in an RNN or initializing the recurrent matrix uh, in an RNN to get the result you want. I think. Um, I think though that's not in general enough, right? Um, in general, actually, uh, UA has a, uh, there's a paper, Liu and Howard 2020, that describes the relationship between uh, scale invariant, the conditions on RNNs basically to give out uh, scale invariance, uh, scale uh, covariance in the sense of the, um, the translation with rescalings uh, that we saw. And the, the assumptions are twofold. One is that the eigenvalues of your recurrent matrix need to be distributed in a geometric series, right? Which is easy enough. The other requirement uh, is that the eigenvectors have to be translated versions of one another, right? Um, which is incredibly restrictive. And once you're there, well, you're Laplace transform or inverse Laplace transform, right? So I, I think if those are the requirements and that's what we want, why not just write that down in the first place and not have to learn it, right? Um, you know, the, the things you need to do to learn that RNN, right, need not be anything you'd learn from a particular task, right? It, you know, you wouldn't want to build a retina that has to learn. You want your retina to be right. your retina, right? <laughs> and so it faces every possible stimulus. So I, the way I see this is that this is a commitment made by the measuring device, not something that's being learned. You can learn what is what, you know, and what you care about and what's salient. But this, I, I think there should be a really deep commitment to time. Uh, time is not the thing. <laughs> time is the thing we put stuff in. It's like, would you represent an object in space? Would you represent, would you choose how space is? No, you want to have the object be, you know, able to be translated around. And I think time exactly like that, right? Uh, so I, I think there's a deep commitment in the nervous system to this. And I think there's a really, really fundamental reason why it is. Thank you, very interesting, thank you. Okay, right, so we have one last question in the chat um, from Yost. Uh, he says he's working with an R RNN, LMU in parentheses, that can scale its prime constant adaptively to the dynamics of the environment. And it seems that there's some evidence this also happens in the brain. And he's citing uh, Wang et al's work. Could the performance of the set network be improved with such adaptive scaling of time constant? Or is there no need for that? Um, so the first short answer, so first of all, um, uh, if you're interested in LMU, um, uh, so are we. Uh, and I saw this recent paper, uh, it might, you might be on it, um, with, um, uh, from uh, Elias Smith's lab, uh, where they're changing the fee parameter in the LMU. And that, that's pretty interesting. Um, the analog of that actually here is not changing the time constants, changing the, uh, actually the base of the logarithm. Right is the analog of that manipulation uh, in the uh, deep Sith network. Um, I think there's absolutely a place. So because there's every time constant represented, it's kind of like in the context of Legendre polynomials having a basis set that tiles the whole thing. Right, the the set of time constants is analogous to the basis set uh, of the Legendre polynomials. The continuity. Uh, the effective continuity of time constants is giving you a basis set over time. Um, we've done a ton of work, actually, uh, which I didn't talk about, um, letting the, uh, the scale of all of the time constants vary together. Turns out that's a really good way to make uh, place cells, right? If all of the time constants are manipulated by the velocity, Instead of having a differential equation that goes d by dt, you effectively have, if you multiply the right-hand side by dx dt, the velocity, you end up, and again, you have to be careful about uh, some stuff, 
um, you end up with a Laplace transform with respect to position, whatever you're integrating. Um, and so we, in, in that sense, we've done a ton of work on this, uh, thinking about this as a general mechanism for uh, play cells and evidence accumulation cells and all kinds of stuff. Hopefully I got an answer in there somewhere. Okay. Right. okay, I think that's it. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Howard, for a very interesting and informative talk. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. Our next talk, uh, Journal Club, will be on April 27th, and we will send out the announcement pretty soon. So thank you again, and see you all soon.